going to shake up, Jesus is about to shake up the entire, uh, he's going to shake up the civilization and the social structure as they know it. Because understand, until that point, Pharisees and Sadducees have great power, great control. And also, those people that worked around the temple and, and, and that were the teachers in the church, they had all the knowledge. They had great power and control. Jesus was none of these things, and people were starting to follow him. And Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. So people are on lookout. So you got to understand, when we talk about the feast, it was the Passover feast, and this was something that, uh, in the Jewish culture, they would go there annually. And it was a feast where they were, of course... Um, recognizing and celebrating God freeing them from the Egyptian uh, king. And so if you go to the book of Exodus, we all know the story. Uh, they, they, they were enslaved. The Israelites were enslaved by, by the Egyptian king, Pharaoh. Pharaoh uh, pretty much had them under control. And Pharaoh, of course, he was, feel, he was fearful that there were too many uh, Jews living amongst them at the time. And he thought they were going to take over Egypt. So he said, we got to enslave them. And he says, also, we've got to slow these people down from reproducing. So he says, we got to, he demands that all Jewish male babies be killed. Because you understand, if you kill the male babies and they can't reproduce, then they can't outnumber us. So he, that was his plan. He said, we're going to enslave them and we're going to kill off all the male, uh, male children. And we're going to take back over because there's too many Jews here in Egypt. They, they, they're going to outnumber us. They're going to take over. So fast forward. Of course, God, of course, uh, you know, Moses escaped, he raises up Moses, Moses comes back and he frees the people and, and God blesses the people and calls the, the people of Israel, you know, his, his people, his, his chosen folks. So now we fast forward, we have Jesus. He's walking around. They're coming back. The celebration uh, is they're celebrating the, the Passover. And so here's why this is pivotal. Why this is pivotal is Jesus... If you go read the Gospels, you'll understand that Jesus went to Jerusalem multiple times. But at a minimum, we know uh, John account makes an account that he went back to Jerusalem at least six times. He identifies him being in, in, in Jerusalem at least six times. But if you understand Jewish culture, you understood they went back to Jerusalem annually for the Passover. But then there are also two other feasts, uh, the Feast of, uh, of Booths and also the Feast of Dedication. So we have an idea that Jesus was going back to Jerusalem pretty often just just because he was part of Jewish culture and we know one of the first things that happens to him is so important that Mary takes Jesus of course back in Luke chapter 2 it take, he takes uh, Jesus back to be dedicated and circumcision happens all that other stuff so understand Jesus has been back in Jerusalem and although he's from uh, Nazareth that's his hometown he's pretty familiar with Jerusalem and you understand too if you read and understand that if you start reading and understanding John the Baptist, it becomes pretty clear that Jesus was even baptized near Jerusalem. And, and, and just uh, since we got a little time, let's go to Matthew real quick and you can see it for your own eyes. You don't have to believe my words. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 5 through 7, we start to get a little clarity. Matthew chapter 3, 5 through 7 says this. Then went out him, uh, then went out to him Jerusalem and all of Judea and regions around uh, Jordan. And we talking about they went out to John the Baptist and they were baptized of him in the Jordan confessing their sins. But when they saw, or when he saw, uh, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came uh, to the baptism, he said unto them. So understand this is John the Baptist. He understands who the Pharisees and Sadducees are. He understands these people really don't mean what they're about. So they're supposed to be these religious people and they're supposed to be all this, but he understands what they're about. So here's what he says. He says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So he says, Jesus is coming. Has anybody told you to flee? And he calls them vipers. So we understand they're snakes. So we understand he's kind of calling out that they don't trust. But the main thing I want you to point out there, it says, all of Jerusalem came to John the Baptist. So Jerusalem had to be relatively close. And then we also know if you go to uh, go to uh, 13, so flip over to chapter 13, verse 17, and this becomes pretty evident as well. In 13, 17, it says, and this is Jesus speaking, it says, For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So understand, um, Jesus here 
is explaining it and he is the purpose in a parable. He's trying to talk about parables, but he's explaining to them why he speaks in parables because he ain't really trying to talk to everybody. But understand, Jesus is baptized also by John the Baptist. And what you start to understand when you, you understand that is people around Jerusalem, because the scripture tells us when Jesus is baptized, it says the voice of the Lord spoke out and said, you know, pretty much, you know, this is my son. And let everybody know that this is the Messiah. And so it's very clear. It becomes very clear what's going on. And so, but people still didn't, you know, didn't want to believe or didn't want to take hold of it. But understand when Jesus is baptized, that's when his ministry begins. That, that's when, the, that's when, the, that's when the, the, the ministry of Jesus pretty much begins at his, after he's baptized. And then, of course, Jesus is baptized. Then he goes into the wilderness to be tempted. And then his ministry starts. So understand John the Baptist is, is getting all this stuff out. He's explaining all this stuff. And so now we come back to the point. Jesus makes his triumphal entry on the time of the feast. It was an annual feast. So, he, so one thing you got to understand what's going on here. He's going back to a pretty familiar place in Jerusalem, but here's the problem. Jesus is going back to a place in which he's familiar. And sometimes I think we get confused by understanding the people, because I told you it was an annual feast, it's people coming from all over the country coming to this feast. And they, you know, they, 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 they end up coming to Jerusalem because that's where the feast is held. So understand the people that, that have started to hear about the story of the Lazarus being raised, it's not necessarily the people of Jerusalem that get excited. But the people that are starting to get excited about it are all the people that are hearing of the miraculous things of Jesus Christ. And they're, remember, they're, they're descending upon uh, Jerusalem because this is the, this is the feast time. It's the, it's the Passover feast. And they start to hear about this Messiah. This guy is calling himself the Son of God. And they're hearing all these wild things he's doing. And eventually they get to the point, if you flip to uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, where it, now we get back to where he's making this triumphal entry. He's, he's coming in now and people start to figure out what's going on. So Luke chapter 19, uh, and in verse 40, we start to get with Jesus is making his entry. And so we'll start at verse 40. It says, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you, uh, tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones will cry out for me. So understand what's happening here. This is right before, uh, you remember the, the, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, he said, hey man, get your, get these, get these uh, disciples under control, get these people under control. And so Jesus, without blinking an eye, because if you read verse 39, it says, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy uh, disciples. And then in verse 40, it goes on to say, Jesus said, if they don't cry out, if they don't cheer, he said, the rocks are going to cry out for me. And then in verse 41, it goes on, it says, And when he was come near and beheld the city. So as he comes and he's beholding Jerusalem, he wept over it. And here's why he wept, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at the least in this day, uh, or thy day, this thing which belongs unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. So understand, Jesus starts to weep. And everybody knows that scripture. If you remember any scripture, people say Jesus wept. Understand, Jesus was weeping because he understood that these people, he's going back to the city, back to Jerusalem, back to a place that he'd spent a lot of time. Back to the place that even, you know, when we talk about it, we know he's he's baptized near Jerusalem. We understand his mom brought him back there to be dedicated, which they, you know, all the Jewish kids had to do. But then also we understand that, remember, on one of the, when Jesus was 12 years old, uh, when they went to the Passover, he, that's where he was in the temple, and he stayed in that temple, and he was, you know, he was in there with the, with the priest, and they, they in there talking, and they teaching. And they were like, you know, and that's when Mary realized she left her son. They had to go back and get him. But for three days, he was in that temple. He was teaching, talking, asking questions to, to you know, to the high priest of the priests. And they were, they were marveling like, okay, who is this 12-year-old kid? And how does he know so much? And why is he so interested in this? So that marveled a lot of people. So all this stuff happens in Jerusalem. So he's making his way back to Jerusalem. 
And understand he has all these people cheering for him. And they they going crazy. They're cheering because they understand he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And they really starting to believe this is the Messiah. This is the this is this is the Messiah. This is God's chosen. This is the this is our Savior. So they're getting excited. And remember, they're making a pilgrimage. So these people are coming from all over. And so you say, okay, then how do we get to Palm Sunday? So understand these people that are cheering are all these pilgrims that are making this privilege, this uh they're making the the, uh, the trip and the trek to Jerusalem to celebrate the the, uh, the, the feast or the Passover uh, season, and so they start hearing these stories of Jesus Christ, and they they bring out these palms, and and the Bible talks about it. We'll read it, but they bring out these palms. They start waving and worshiping, so they are happy, and it's kind of like to me they like pom poms, and so like when you go to a sporting event, when when a team does something good. You know, everybody starts shaking the pom-poms, or they got noisemakers. And so the same thing with, the, with these palms. So let's go to John chapter 12, uh, verse, uh, John chapter 12, and we'll, we'll start reading it at verse, and we already read this, verse, verse 12 through uh, 20. And understand Jesus, he's coming back. And so Jesus is making his entry, and people are, you know, they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. But understand, I think we get confused and saying and understanding the people that were shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, the people that were cheering, the people that were, were throwing their coats down, and then the people that, that, that were doing all this stuff, understand it was the pilgrims. It wasn't necessarily the people of Jerusalem. And you say, well, why is that important? It's because the people of Jerusalem, the ones who had heard the stories of God, uh, Jesus, just like everybody else, the ones in the, the places where Jesus had came and visited, the word was getting out on them, they're the ones that decide to kill him. The pilgrims are the ones, the ones that, that, that are coming from all over to go to this place. They are the ones that are praising and, 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 and you know and praising and screaming Hosanna, Hosanna. So sometimes I think we get confused saying, well, how did the same people that were cheering him end up killing him? But it really wasn't them that was part of that. Understand the people that were cheering him that were, that were, that were having a good time were the pilgrims. Now you say, well, why is that important? And how does that tie back to the to what I meant, what I started this off with, which was uh, the young man Nipsey Hussle, because what you started to realize after you got into it was even though they had, Nipsey Hussle had a lot of people in his own um, neighborhood that loved and adored him, he probably had more fans outside of his neighborhood. He had probably a greater impact on people that never really met him, never knew him, never knew his struggle, but they were huge fans of his. So those were the ones that were waving Hosanna, Hosanna. It was the fans of Jesus. They just heard about him. And, and they heard some of the stuff. And they're like, hey, I like this guy. Hey, this guy just raised somebody from the dead. He just fed hungry people. He just healed the sick. So they hearing about him. They ain't really experienced him. Remember, he ain't coming back to their towns two or three times a year. They don't really know him. But they start to hear about what he's doing. And they get excited. And they realize who he is because they know the scriptures too. So when they see him and he summons for this cult, and he comes in on this donkey, and they know the scriptures, and they know the prophecy. They say, hey, this is the guy. He has done everything that they promised he would do in the Old Testament. So they know who he is. So they start saying, Savior, Savior, Hosanna, Hosanna, and, and, and you know, some, save us. I mean, they know who he is. This, they know he is the Savior. And so they get excited about it. And it's the same way when you start looking at what happened to this young man was, it was a lot of people he affected outside of his community. And they probably were bigger fans of the people that knew him when he was a child and had, had raised him. And so the same thing with Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, the people that should have known him, should have been his biggest fans, were the ones that ended up causing him the greatest pain. So understand, as we fast forward, and we'll get into this, I'm, I'm assuming next week, because it's Easter Sunday, but everybody knows what happens at the end. He comes into, he makes his trial for entry. The Pharisees and the Sadducees stand there, they're looking at this, and they're saying, man, we're going to lose our power. And understand, if you got that's what's so funny about the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were Jews in, 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 in a Greek uh, country of Rome, so they really had no power. Romans were in control, but they had a little, little clout in their own community. So, But they said, we don't want to lose our clout. So they said, hey, they start whispering around each other. They said, hey, they starting to follow this guy. And they say, you know what, we got to do something about this guy. So, and then if you if you study on further, you understand that one of the things that Jesus does, unfortunately or fortunately, he goes 
and does some stuff that they don't like. So there's a couple things that set, set you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the people off in Jerusalem. One, he was saying he was God, a child of God. Two, he, uh, one, of the, one of the major things he does is he, when, when he starts his ministry, one of the first things he does, he, sets up, he uh, upsets the apple cart by going into the temple and, and throwing people out of the temple because they were in there doing wrong stuff and charging people and overcharging people and charging people a price to come, to come really, in order to have access to God, they, they were really overcharging people or charging people or choosing who could come and who couldn't come. So he totally cleans out the temple. That really made some people upset. And then lastly, they start to see this man got all these people. They got jealous of his popularity. Because now all the people, they ain't coming to Jerusalem just for the feast. A lot of those people come into Jerusalem because they want to see the Savior. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees, they start looking around. They say, man, this guy getting too popular. He getting too big. They starting to follow him. They ain't listening to us. So even the people that were in the temples, those had been called to rightly divide the scriptures, they got concerned. Because they said, well, where's, who's this young guy, this 33-year-old guy, he was 30 when he started his ministry, 33 when he, when he ended it, about. They said, who's this young guy who he ain't near as old as us, he speaks like he knows the word better than us, and people are starting to listen to him, they got jealous. And so they said, we got to do something to end this. And so that starts... The idea and the seed and the mindset of we have to kill Jesus. And so as we fast forward throughout through, through Passion Week, what we get to the point of it is the people in Jerusalem, the people where he had spent time, the people who knew who Jesus was, they never heard the name before. They knew who he was. They heard about him being in the temple for three days with, with, the, with the priest. Those are the people that said, kill this man. It wasn't the pilgrims, the people that was coming from out of town. They was praising him. Oh, Hosanna, Savior, save us. They knew exactly who Jesus was. The people that should have known who Jesus was were the people in Jerusalem. And they're the main ones that turned on them. So I close this morning by saying we should not be confused or amazed why when this happens in our own life. For whatever reason, it's the people that should love us the most that oftentimes causes the greatest pain. And if you say, well, well, what do you mean? It happened to Jesus. The people that should have loved him the most, the people in his hometown, the people in Jerusalem when he returns, they should have loved him. They should have been the ones waving the palms and laying out the clothes so, so, uh, and, and doing all those things, but they weren't. Those are the people that should have been doing it. It was the people on the outside as the ones that appreciated who he was. They were the ones that were worshiping him. And... You say, well, the greatest pain because do you understand, much like the young man that, 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 that was buried this week, someone from his own town, someone that knew him, someone that could look around and see, hey, man, this guy's really doing good things for our community. He really is. He didn't just take his money and leave. He actually is investing his money. He actually hiring guys that usually wouldn't get jobs. They could look around and see what he was doing. But much like the scriptures we, we read here say, they'll become blind. So even when they see good, they done got hard, and their heart so hard, they can't even, they, their eyes won't allow them to see it. And so even though the people in Jerusalem, you say, well, how did they kill Jesus after he done all these good things? How, how did they allow this to happen? Because their hearts had gotten so hardened that even if they look back over to all the stuff that Jesus did, they knew all the great things he did, they did not care. Because he was upsetting their apple cart so much, and they were filled with so much hate and jealousy towards him, that they said he is a threat to us. I don't care what good he's doing. He can't do enough good. We must kill him. He must be eradicated. And so the people in Jerusalem made that decision. And it's no different oftentimes than when we look at our own lives here on earth. It's the people that you would think should love you. The people you think looking out for you. The people you think have your back often cause you the greatest pain. Those are the people that give you the least amount of support. Those are the people that that, that will speak you up. It's amazing to me how you meet people that don't know you very well. They will, they will tell somebody else how great of experience you are, how nice of a person you are. It's just kind of funny. If you ask somebody about you, oftentimes when somebody hears something about you, you say, well, who told you that? It's not a family member. It's not a friend. They'll say, man, I heard you're a really nice guy. I heard you're a good guy. I heard you're a really, you're a really good person. Who told you that? It's some stranger. It's somebody that really you're not even that close to. 
Because, but if you think it would be the other way around, you think it'd be your family saying, hey man, you're really, he a really good dude. He a really nice guy. It ain't your family that do that. It ain't gonna be your friends. It's gonna be somebody that you had one or two encounters with. That's the person that's gonna say, hey, that's a really good guy. He got a really good head on his shoulder. He really does have a plan of vision to do great things. And that's the same way when Jesus walked on this earth, it was the same situation. We, can, we start to think that Jesus like had this huge following by people that knew him a long time. The disciples, if you look at it, they didn't even know him a long time. But understand, he was such a powerful being. And when you understood who he was, people were drawn to him. And they would say, how was the word getting out? Hey, I went to see this man, Jesus. He changed my life. Well, how long were you around him? Oh, only a couple hours. Only a few minutes. The woman with the issue of blood said, if I just touched him as long, she wasn't around him long. She didn't even get that close to him because she had to reach out and fight to just get a touch. But understand, those are the kind of people that Jesus, he was changing their lives. And they were going back and telling how great he was. But it was the people that should have known, the people from his hometown in Nazareth, the people that, that he had been coming in and out of Jerusalem, the people that should have been like, this Jesus, a, he, a, a, he a good dude, this is the Savior. They said, nope, I'm not going to support him. I'm not going to praise him. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hurt him. And so that's what happens to us oftentimes. The people we think should love us the most, much like our, our young man that I, that I started with, he met his demise in his own place. Somebody that, sh that should have been a fan, should have been the biggest fan, should have been like under no circumstances can we harm this guy because he's too big for our community. They said, nope, he offended me, he hurt my pride, he must die. And that's the same thing that Jesus did. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, he hurt their pride, he offended them when he would, would speak the word and, and when he would tell them what the real word of God was and they didn't like it and it didn't line up with their agenda. He offended them, and they determined, they said, he must die. And so that's why they crucified Jesus. That's why they, they turned him over. That's why they set him up. That's why they decide to kill him, because of pride and jealousy. And I close this morning by bringing, we need to bring some attention. And here I'm talking directly to one group of people. We have got to do something in the black community about black men hating each other to the point that we feel like the only thing we can do to get our point across when we don't agree with somebody and when they've gotten too big or they've gotten too successful that we have to kill them to make a point. And if you just look throughout history and I'm not talking about, I know there are some situations where uh, people covertly have, have gone about uh, hurting people and harming people, but we know that in, the, in our community, in the black community as males, Oftentimes, when somebody's gotten too successful or we feel like they've gotten too big, they're not even welcome back in their own hometown. So no matter what they do, no matter how much they do, we feel like we got to bring them down a peg. And it would be great if we would only bring them down a peg. But oftentimes, when we're black males, we don't just want to bring them down. We want to kill them. And so we got to be careful here because that is the same mindset of the people that killed Jesus Christ. They didn't care about what good he was doing. They didn't care about how brilliant he was. They didn't care about he was raising people from the dead, healing the sick. They didn't care that he came to heal, deliver, and set free. The only thing they said was, I don't care, he's getting too big. And so they said, not only do we have to knock him down a peg or two, but we got to kill him. And unfortunately, that's what's going on in, in the black community amongst males. When a black man becomes successful, if he tries to go back to his neighborhood, either one, he's not doing enough, but even if he is doing enough, even if he is trying to advance and he's trying to give back and he's trying to share how he, how he made it, if he tries to go back and be, be too comfortable, they don't just want to, they don't just want to harm him, they want him dead. And unfortunately, much like Jesus, much like Nipsey Hussle, much like Countless other black men in this country find out if you get a little bit of success Our hatred amongst one another is so great that we feel like I just can't hurt you brother. I gotta end your life So in this Palm Sunday, I, I, I end with that of understanding Jesus Christ was worshipped. He was beloved by people that truly didn't know him as, as, as well as some people knew him and the people that knew him the greatest. People that had spent the most time with him. They hated him.
they didn't believe and they couldn't follow him. And I just wanted to bring that to clarity. When we talk about Palm Sunday, we say, why is Palm Sunday so important? You understand the people that were cheering the loudest, were waving their palms, were doing all this stuff for Jesus. They were people that were pilgrims. They were coming from all over the country. They were coming from all over the land to come back to, to, to the uh, Passover feast. But they knew who Jesus was. And when they had an encounter with him, they cheered him. They applauded him. And they worshipped him. But understand, in a mere five days, they're going to kill him. God bless you. Have a good Sunday. And happy Palm Sunday to you.